Good afternoon to those who are on the East Coast. A good morning to those of you on the West Coast and Central Time Zone. And a good evening to those watching from Europe, Israel, and parts all parts of the world. Today, we're incredibly blessed. Today, we really have not only an incredible educator, but one of the world's experts on, on PTSD as it happens on the battlefront. Dr. Jeff Berman has worked for decades with war vets, Vietnam veterans, Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans, and over the course of decades has mentored them, worked with them. And today what he's going to do that is something incredible is give us an understanding from a biological point of view, from a neurological point of view, as well as from a perspective of the therapy. How is it, what happens in terms of PTSD for us to understand what happens to the person, who's susceptible to it, and then ultimately, how do we go about the treatment? And Dr. Berman is such, an, is such a clear educator. It will give us an insight and an appreciation for what we're doing in Israel right now, what the soldiers are going through, and what will be one of the greatest challenges of Israeli society in the aftermath of this war. Without further ado, a real honor, a real blessing for all of us to learn from, to listen to, and to grow from the knowledge, the teachings of Dr. Jeff Berman. Thank you, Rabbi Weil. It's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to speak to this uh, large and uh, robust audience. The purpose of speaking is exactly as Rabbi Weil said, I'd like to give people who are um, not in the medical or in one of the uh, behavioral health fields an understanding of PTSD because this is going to be the underpinning and it's the objective of what we're attempting to do in terms of building a, again, a robust and comprehensive treatment program for um, uh, members of SAHO who have been through um, uh, and experienced a battle and may have been exposed to events that can cause them to develop PTSD. Uh, this is the first time in my medical career, frankly, that I've uh, encountered a program that is comprehensive, it is multidimensional, and it is looking forward in terms of time to minimize the problem for people who have developed it now, treat people who develop symptoms of PTSD going forward, and is able to adapt through research and uh, just simple observation what is going on with people as the disease uh, develops. As we treat, one of the benefits of this program is that research data is going to be collected, not just for the sake of writing a paper, which of course is important to advance academics, but particularly to advance treatment and see what the state of the art will be two, five, and 10 years from now. So I'd like to share my screen at this point. But before I go on, I also want to mention one other thing. When you walk away from the talk today, I hope everyone will have a better understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder as a biological illness, as are all other uh, behavioral health issues, and also the complexity of this illness and why it demands the type of program that FIDF is building along with the Ministry of Defense and with SAHO. So we're starting out with a great program. We're going to enhance it, and your contributions to this cause are going to make an enormous difference in how we treat the people who are out there on the front lines. And I might even add, not only on the front lines, but who are exposed to people on the front lines and their families. There will ultimately also be a spillover in terms of knowledge gain for the Israeli civilian population, uh, many of whom are suffering from uh, exposure to trauma as well. So may I share my screen? Um, the most, there, there are several important things to keep in mind about what we call today as of 1980, really formally labeled post-traumatic stress disorder. So first of all, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? It's a disabling psychiatric or mental health problem that results from exposure to threatened injury, death, and even sexual assault, all of which have occurred recently with members of SAHO and uh, uh, civilians who have been exposed to the events of uh, October 7th. One of the key things about PTSD, which makes it an important uh, illness to recognize early on, 
is that by recognizing the symptoms, the potential symptoms early on, it can be treated. And as in many other illnesses, the earlier you detect the illness, the sooner you can intervene and you can minimize progression. So how does PTSD uh, present itself? Okay. Um, it presents with a series of symptoms that often someone can come in complaining of, but often the people around the individual see. People can complain of re-experiencing the traumatic event. And this happens through nightmares. We all know that if something awful happens to us, we have often have nightmares that, about it. Flashbacks are an event where you re-experience something that's happened. Sometimes you're exposed to a trigger, something that reminds you of the trauma, and you dissociate. You remove yourself from the, um, from the event, and that can cause a lot of uh, much dysfunction. And then, of course, there are many negative emotional uh, reactions to it, which could be depression, anxiety, uh, things resulting in loss of um, self-control, which result in violence. And on a day-to-day -day basis, people often have things like startle responses. You might hear a car backfire. Most of us who live in cities don't really respond much to it. But if you've exposed to, uh, been exposed to gunfire or something along those lines, a simple backfire or a firecracker might bring up a very significant uh, types of reaction. Please keep in mind, if you have these kinds of symptoms after exposure for less than six months, we call it an acute stress disorder. And one of the goals of the program is to try to identify people within that 30-day uh, or six-month period as soon as possible to help uh, prevent the progression of symptoms. This was an article that appeared recently um, in Lancet, and it just speaks about the increased um, prevalence and increased um, incidence of uh, PTSD in various segments of um, Israeli society. So we're dealing with a really uh, significant problem, even if it affects 10% of those who have been exposed to combat, we've rotated through approximately 350,000 um, uh, Chayalim, and that would amount to about 30 to 35,000 people who are at very, very high risk for developing the syndrome. Now, I mentioned before that PTSD is not a, uh, it's not something wifty. It's a biological illness. And I think that is the most significant message to bring across. Our brains consist of, and I know not many people have done uh, neuroscience or taken neuroanatomy, but just take it. The brain looks like that. And uh, I don't know if you can see, is, is everyone able to see me holding up the brain in the hand? Okay, I have a model in my hand as well. And this is about the real size of a human brain. The point is the brain is very complex. It's wired in an even more complex fashion, but it depends, uh, it, it's dependent day to day on an integration of all the parts of the brain. It's like when you open up your, uh, the hood of your car, you realize there are many, many parts there. None of them function independently. A proper functioning, uh, vehicle depends on all the parts being wired, being coordinated in their action, and there being no interruption or uh, exaggeration function of any particular car. So no need to memorize the parts, but there are five parts of the brain mentioned in a little while. Again, critical thing here is this is not an imagined illness. This is not something you can give someone a slap on the back of the head and say, hey, wake up from this, get over it, you'll be fine. Unfortunately, both in Israel and my experience both in the military and then treating people after military experience has been that many people have said, hey, just get over it. It'll go away. And as we've learned from the Yom Kippur War, it just doesn't go away. This paragraph where I ask you, is it real or imagined? I'm showing the very various parts of the brain that are affected by um, and involved in PTSD. And you'll see here a combination of hormones, neurotransmitters, and parts of the brain, which I had showed you before, uh, all are involved in normal neural functioning, in neuro, normal psychiatric or psychological functioning. But when any one of them is sent out of whack, in other words, there's a change in the structure, 
or there's a change in the amount of a neurotransmitter or neurohormone, things go bad. Many of you have heard of serotonin because of antidepressants. That's one of the um, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain that can be severely affected, as are some of the physical symptoms you often see, such as increased heart rate, blood pressure, and as we mentioned before, increased arousal or a startle response. Now, again, one of the critical things about PTSD that makes it so uh, such an important entity to deal with is that when PTSD occurs, and it, it can occur just in a moment, or it can occur as a result of repeated exposures to a trauma. Depends what the trauma of exposure is. But in the military, it can often be a single, devastating, and um, remarkable event. You'll see that PTSD impacts it's what we call the spirit, the soul, the mind, emotions, memories, and the body. So I think everyone can accept the fact that if heart rate and pulse are impacted, it's a physical reaction. Memories, um, if you think about it, are all generated or uh, they're generated in the brain and stored in the brain as a result of neurotransmitters and something called messenger RNA. Everything that goes on in the brain is biological. And hence, the good part of that is that it can be potentially treated either by medications or by therapy. And, I, and ideally, it's a combination of multiple therapies and possibly medication. Now, post-traumatic stress disorder also is a, an entity that is well embedded in civilization. So this is not just an Israeli or an American phenomenon. You can find allusions to PTSD if you go back in history. And the first uh, text I mentioned here is the Iliad of Homer and the Odyssey, uh, or the Odyssey and you will find that uh, symptoms of PTSD, such as anger, fear, and physical symptoms are mentioned back then. And for those of you who have studied um, done academic biblical studies, you'll find that in the um, Epic of Gilgamesh, you can also find allusions to PTSD. As we go through history, in every major conflict, and often after every major conflict, as I mentioned here, uh, you will find that um, symptoms of PTSD, physical symptoms, what we call psychological symptoms, and what we would call um, uh, cognitive, even cognitive symptoms um, occur. And it, you find it, and I just selected um, several portions of, of history to show you, but even in the uh, Crimean War, all of the entities involved had descriptions of what they of what we now call PTSD. Um, one place where PTSD became very carefully pulled out was in the 1840s to 50s in England as a result of the multiple rail accidents that they had. People were traumatized afterwards, and it was a combination of fear, fright, and alarm, which is one way to look at uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Again, it was repeated in the Boer War. It was uh, described later on in um, World War I. You heard about things such as shell stock. And finally, in uh, 1980, PTSD was, so to speak, codified. It was well described and accepted into the um, psychiatric nomenclature as um, post traumatic stress disorder, which I'll show you in a moment. But you can see here at any given time, various parts of the body were described as having been affected by these devastating events. Again, it could be a soldier who was exposed, for example, if you go back to 1983, when the Marine Corps barracks were bombed uh, in Beirut, people who were trapped inside or were concerned about their colleagues who were trapped inside. It could be from going into um, going on to long range missions and going around always on edge that something might happen. And one single shot from a sniper or one uh, improvised explosive device going off could set someone up for PTSD. I wanna mention though, not everybody exposed to trauma develops post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's a function of each individual. And the term that we're gonna use, because we're gonna come back to it at the end, is how resilient is someone. 
based on someone's resiliency and the nature of the exposure uh, and the nature of the uh, uh, traumatic event that they're exposed to will determine what the outcome is in the individual. But the whole body can be affected. The nervous system alone can be uh, affected. And parts of the body are responsive. So you can get someone, again, who hears that backfiring car and um, they will start to have a, a triggered response with rapid heartbeat, rapid breathing. They might even dissociate for a moment to sort of remove themselves from the situation. Now, in 1980, the, um, uh, the DSM-5, for those of you who are not in the mental health area in medicine, is known as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, ver um, version five. And that's the book that's used, uh, the criteria that's used to make any psychiatric diagnosis. So again, I want to emphasize we're dealing with something that is real. We're dealing with something that's physical. We're unfortunately dealing with something that is prevalent, but and it has been well described. And there are nine criteria uh, that are used to describe PTSD. So the first is someone has to have been exposed to an event that um, either is traumatic, that they felt was a threat to harming themselves, and the example I'll give there is there were people obviously in the Twin Towers in 2001 who suffered immense trauma because they, there was a building going down around them or near them and they were fleeing. But there were also people sitting on the other side of the Hudson River in New Jersey who saw this happening. And who can take that image out of their minds? If I told you, take away the image of the Twin Towers coming down, I don't think any of us would be capable of doing that. It becomes embedded, and there's sometimes when we see something happening, it reminds us of what happened previously. Um, as a result, people come in and they present with things, as I mentioned before, nightmares. This is what we call re-experiencing. They can have flashbacks, or they can see something happen that emotionally distresses them. I'm going to jump ahead without changing the slides. So I want to point out one thing. All of us have had nightmares. Many of us have had flashbacks. Uh, many of these things can occur to all of us. But when they interfere with our social, occupational, or educational functioning, that's when we're dealing with a significant type of illness. And if you have a soldier who is going back into a combat situation, and this isn't recognized, it puts a soldier at risk because if a gunshot or something like that helps them, uh, not helps them, excuse me, causes them to dissociate or causes them to have their thoughts go elsewhere. It puts them into a dangerous situation. They are not able to accomplish their mission safely because they are distracted. And imagine for those of us who don't have moment to moment critical types of functioning, if we get distracted for a moment, it doesn't matter. But when you're in a high stress, high risk situations such as combat, every distraction can be troubling. So the earlier we recognize these symptoms, uh, the better it is for the people who are affected. Uh, people will often, if they've been exposed to a certain type of situation, stay away from certain other situations. Um, they might stay away from crowds. They might stay away from large buildings. They may stay away from certain uh, instances where there's a lot of noise. Um, Another is, um, as, and we'll talk about briefly at the end, one of the other things that happens is people often um, often forget parts of the trauma that occur. They find that they're in a difficult or stressful situation. They can forget they, their mind, their brain has retrained itself to forget and ignore dangerous situations. So not only will they not remember it, but in day-to-day -day life going forward, they might tend to, and I'll use the term, black out about situations that they find to be potentially troubling. Uh, the issue about hypervigilance is that person who's walking, waiting for the next shoe to drop. People have difficulty focusing and concentrating. And again, if you're distracted by something, it's hard to keep your focus on one thing. That's particularly troubling when you're in the military. Sleep is hard enough to come by, but when you have another another uh, trigger to keep you from sleeping, that's particularly bothersome.
We mentioned before uh, the persistence of symptoms for more than one month. And as I said before, I jumped ahead to that. The disturbance causes significant uh, functional impairment. You can't do your job. You can't get along with your family. You're not able to meet social um, and educational obligations. And in one of the things that the program that's being expanded in Israel at uh, Shiva Medical Center is that before we make any kind of a diagnosis of PTSD, one of the most important things to do with PTSD, as well as other psychiatric disorders, is to make sure that the symptoms we're seeing are not due to either a substance, and we could be talking about illicit drug or an illicit drug, and that it's not due to other medication being taken, and that it's not due to another medical problem. So the, as I mentioned, the comprehensive process will involve a full physical, as well as psychiatric slash mental health evaluation of each person who presents. The parts of the brain, by the way, I mentioned before, there were several critical parts. Um, imagine that well-oiled, well-integrated machine that I had showed you before. It's very um, intricately wired, and each part has to communicate properly with the next. Upon experiencing a major trauma, some individuals have that wiring, and I'll use the term a little bit loosely, but it is wired through nerve cells, is disrupted. The neocortex is the part of the brain we do much to our thinking, and we have what we call executive function. When that gets disturbed, either from a direct blow to the head or exposure to a traumatic injury, an individual loses the ability to use their judgment to filter out what's going on. The um, amygdala is what we call the alerting center of the brain. Normally, that helps us. That's where fight or flight develops. But if it becomes overly sensitive and does not have input from the other part of the brain, called the neocortex, it becomes an easy, it's like a car alarm that just keeps going off and off. It becomes disruptive and it's no longer something that is helping the individual. The hippocampus, on the other hand, is the part of the brain that's most associated with memory. And if that part of the brain becomes disrupted, for example, parts of the memory are wiped out, maybe as a protective measure on the part of the individual with post-traumatic stress disorder, Nevertheless, when you lose parts of your memory, it become, you become somewhat dysfunctional. So that's a very brief course in neuroanatomy. Um, and uh, it, you know, it takes years to really fully understand it, but I think you can all get a grasp of the fact just that you might understand the parts of a car. These are the basic parts. They have to be working well. They have to be working in sync and they can never be working either too much or too little. It's a fine balance. Again, the program is designed in a very comprehensive way and a very thoughtful way to address each of the areas, both physically and in terms of, uh, in terms of the psychology of what's going on. Everything here is as a result of uh, neurons, the brain being wired and connected by neurotransmitters as well as neurohormones. So sort of to come to the end of this is the program's goal, first of all, in any medical field, is first to alleviate suffering. We have people being airlifted out of uh, combat zones, and those are the people who are most acutely affected, people who have lost their ability to function and stay safe. So we want to first alleviate suffering of people, um, even in, in terms of anxiety and sleep. As I mentioned before, we don't want the disease to progress. So there, there are systems being developed. And when I say systems, what I mean is people are being educated, commanders, um, other treatment professionals. And believe me, we're going to be educating more individuals than we have psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers. This is an immense, uh, an immense undertaking. And we're going to try to train as many people to recognize the symptoms of PTSD so that people can get uh, treatment as early as possible. Ultimately, we want people to come back to full function if possible, and as often is the case, they're able to rotate back into their um, into their units and their combat role. And if anyone has seen any interviews with um, you know with members of Tsavo who who have been injured in any way, whether through PTSD or a physical injury, their soul 
belief that, that they hold is I want to get well so I can go back and be with my unit. And we want to reinforce that kind of thinking and not prevent it unless someone is incapable of doing so. And we mentioned the word resilience. Resilience is what we're trying to build into all of our, um, to everyone in Saho, but we want to restore resilience, which is the ability of the, um, the, it's the ability of an individual to cope with, to interpret and deal with new stressors as they come along without going down the path of developing a pathological or a, um, a, a, a developing a, a psychological entity that prevents them from engaging in social, occupational, and educational functioning. So again, this is a comprehensive approach. And again, it's the first time in my career that I've seen something addressed in such a thoughtful way. And, um, you know, after 30 years of experience, I think that's something that I'm really proud to say that FIDF has gotten behind. And this will make a difference, not just in the ILM today, the, the impact will be felt 10, 15, 20, and 30 years going forward. One other thing, if you've been exposed to trauma, it might not show up today. It might not show up in two weeks. It could show up in five years. And having a program that recognizes that possibility will make treatment uh, more possible. Treatment works, um, integrated treatment works best. We debrief, we offer support. We recognize the conditions and the candidates for treatment. We do a full assessment. We use what's called the bio, psychosocial approach. We look at the individual holistically. We use the appropriate therapies, both supportive, individual group therapy, uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. We have what we call evidence-based treatments for patients, and we also have medication available. I would put medication at the bottom. We're really trying to rehabilitate people's um, uh, minds and really get them back into the best functioning possible. Medication more so improves symptoms. They're not um, curative. And that is what I would have to say. If anyone has questions, um, I'll give it back to you, Rabbi Wow. Well. Dr. Berman, thank you very much. Thank you for putting, you know, years and years of education into 25 minutes like that. Dr. Berman, just out of curiosity, do you have a pen and paper where you're at? Um, I uh, have a pen. There's a number of questions that we have. Sure. And I'm just thinking maybe if I give you, you know, maybe a chance for it. I'm ready. Good. I'm good. So the first question that we have for you, by the way, Yehuda, maybe it's possible to take the um, take the screen. You know, we can get back a, an image of Dr. Berman. Okay. On the oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yep. Let me stop sharing. I'll stop. Here we go. Okay. So the first question is this. One thing that you shared with our staff is that when it comes to PTSD, you can't put someone into a box. There's no such thing as one size or even three or four sizes that fits all. If you could elaborate upon that, that's the first question. Second question is, if you could elaborate, you'd mentioned when we spoke beforehand that part of the therapy is training the soldier how to respond. I'll give you an example. If, if an airplane went overhead, probably 99.9% .9 of the population would say, there's an airplane going over my head. But that soldier may go dive under a table, dive under a bed, may go, be, go into a state of paralysis or, or shaking or shivers. How do you train that person suffering from PTSD where they actually coach themselves? They actually hear the stimulus, understand they're going into a dark, dreary place, but need to realize this is not a war zone. This is a United Airlines uh, plane on its way to Newark, New Jersey, or something like that. If you could elaborate upon that, that as well. So let me... Um... Let me look at this one in, one instance in particular that you brought up about uh, the soldier hearing an airplane overhead, which is most likely benign, but is apt to be interpreted as a um, something other than a uh, a routine commercial flight. Uh, someone is traumatized by a particular event, 
So you could be talking about a soldier who was exposed to a um, either a, a drone or a missile or some incoming sort of aircraft, which results in the release of um, possibly, it doesn't even have to result in, but could result in the release of high, impa- um, uh, high impact explosive devices. And that causes them an immense amount of harm. So now they've taken a stimulus, and the stimulus is the um, noise of the aircraft, maybe even the image of the aircraft, and it turns to them, it, it turns into in, it turns into a set of symptoms for them. They become traumatized. So what does that mean? They can become, and these are some of the terms I mentioned and we had in slides, they can become hypervigilant. So because of the, the magnitude of this trauma to their brain, I mentioned the amygdala, which was part of the brain, the alerting center. Because of that, their amygdala is on uh, red alert all the time. They hear that, and right away, their heart rate goes up, their breathing goes up, they become very um, anxious, and even taking it further than that, there are people who are walking around, always looking to the sky to see if there's another plane coming in. So the, the goal is to get those parts of the brain working in a more um, functional and less um, threat, being less um, susceptible to threat. For example, if someone is moving about and they've got a lot of anxiety, which is part of PTSD, one thing that could be done is they are treated for the anxiety, that particular individual. They might be put on medication. They might be put into um, group therapy, depending on the um, the, re- the depending on the resources of that individual, depending on their particular needs. So anxiety can be dealt with. They'll be less hyper, they're less prone to hyper arousal. They will be less prone to hypervigilance. And then if they do see a plane coming, it's real, it's not imagined, but what they will learn to do is through the front part of the brain. Remember, we showed a picture of the neocortex. That was the... Um, front part of the brain here, that they will learn to interpret the stimulus and say, yes, I realize that that was threatening at that time, but this is a commercial airliner going overhead. I need not worry about it. And they learn to take that experience and they generalize it to other situations that they might have felt to be threatening. Um, It's a, um, I think that's an example of what you would do there. By the way, the treatment of the anxiety needs to continue either with medication or with therapy. And the patient also learns to change their thinking when confronted by other threatening events. The PTSD might just open up what was existing in the patient before. They may have had some of this hypervigilance or fear of what's going on pre-existing the trauma. But the first question you asked me, and that's an important one, is, This is not a one-size-fits-all program. If you look at the brochure that was, um, and I imagine most people have seen the brochure about the comprehensive comprehensive services uh, added, you have to use um, a, um, uh, see, I can't actually, you need to do a, um, you need to do an X, Y axis kind of um, approach. And what you need to do is you need to look at the individual you look at, need to look at their strengths. You need to look at where they're having symptoms. And then you need to look at all the therapies available. And it's kind of like a, um, a grid. And you figure out what is necessary for each and every patient. It's a little simplistic, but because of the comprehensive assessment I mentioned in the beginning, each of our patients will receive that type of uh, treatment. And that, if you make the right diagnosis and are willing to change diagnoses, if things change in the patient's progress, we can get the best outcomes. Dr. Berman, something else that you had shared with us, if it's okay, I'd love you to share with the people that are participating in the Zoom. And that is that you had said, it's very crucial for the patient to have a relationship with the therapist. So instead of flip-flopping and every month they meet somebody new, they have a long-term relationship where they can build trust so that the therapist can actually have an impact. And that's something that, you know, one would think happens all over the place, but it doesn't, which is also unique to what's happening in terms of this multi-tiered PTSD therapy system that we're funding. 
So generally when someone comes into a doctor's office um, or even to a therapist's office, the therapist or the doctor would say very commonly, what's wrong with you? What, you know, what's your chief complaint? And in our setting, we're going to be using a, an, it's, it's an overarching principle, but it's called trauma-informed care. Everyone who works with these patients, with our clients here, that the you know members of SAHO are going to need to understand the basis of the illness as we went through, and even in, in obviously in more depth to that, the focus is not it's not what's wrong with you, what happened to you, what were you exposed to. We're going to have to be, which we should be anyhow. But here, it's absolutely necessary, non-judgmental. Tell me what happened. Yeah, and, and people have to learn to be really good listeners. And as you said, very often in, in medical settings today, whether in Israel or the United States, you go to the doctor's office, the PA may see you one day, the doctor may see you the next, and it might even be a different doctor the second time. And there's enough in the notes in terms of vital signs and symptoms to allow that to happen. This is a much more in-depth process, and the key is the therapeutic relationship within the context of trauma-informed care. Dr. Berman, there's not enough psychologists or psychiatrists trained in PTSD, and of course that's part of the funding is the goal is to be able to train enough. They're taking social workers, psychologists, and, and psychiatrists who don't have a background in, in dealing with PTSD patients, and they're gonna be training them the goal is, at least on a, the Sheba level, for those who have an acute to be able to handle an extra 6,000 soldiers with acute PTSD, maybe those who have it subacute, it may even be more than that. But could you comment on that? The challenge of, look, a social worker has a role in society and they do a, an incredible amount of good, but, but because there's such a shortage of trained therapists, having to take social workers and train them in, in PTSD therapy. Uh, any thoughts, any comments? Because you hear this all the time out of Israel is that we literally have so many more patients than we have people who can, can service those patients. So I think FIDF uh, working with, um, with the uh, Ministry of Defense, SAHO and Shiva has recognized, first of all, the most important thing is we've recognized this to be an issue. So that's the first step towards solving the problem. You're absolutely right. There are other areas um, in psychiatry that I've been involved with where we have not nearly as uh, not nearly enough trained individuals. So what we do is I think we have to make a commitment that we're going to train individuals in various stages of this process. And one of the things, I mean, this is going before treatment, is to get commanders to be uh, familiar with what some of the signs and symptoms are. We're going to work on um, the soldiers themselves uh, gearing towards self-help and developing resilience. I mean, it's one of the saddest things that I saw after um, uh, 20 years after, you know, 20 years after um, Iraqi freedom, we have many, many American soldiers who are uh, dysfunctional, and have developed, uh, some have engaged, many have engaged in suicidal behavior. I never understood why that should be. Uh, when I went back and looked at my own experience in the area, before deployment for Iraqi freedom, we mobilized hundreds of thousands of reserve soldiers. And what I found out was that we screened them for underlying resilience, things like pre existing anxiety and depression, but we never, we never held people back. The, the word then was push them forward as quickly as you can. And as long as they can function, it doesn't matter if you're depressed, anxious, or have another problem. So the, my point here is, I think the earlier we get, the earlier on, we get commanders and people in training to foster resilience, that will help. But in terms of individuals, we have to train people as well. We might call paraprofessionals people who can be extenders of treatment. That in itself would be the development of a whole new, uh, a whole new field of uh, behavioral health. Training people 
who did not start out in the behavioral health field. They may have had some medical, maybe no medical uh, experience, but they're willing to learn and they're willing to be compassionate because they want to help. And I think that's going to be a big part of what we do. And I think that will guide some research in the area also is how you develop uh, these people. But we're not going to we're not going to be able to tune up the number of um, psychiatrists, psychologists who are um, uh, therapists quickly enough. We're going to have to rely on adjuncts. And that's why each in, each interaction with someone with PTSD has to be a genuine one. It can't just be, well, I'll just move you on to the next uh, to the next station. Each inter each interaction has to be a meaningful one again in the context of trauma informed care. Can you share with us, obviously not names, but a couple of scenarios of some of the veterans that you've dealt with? In other words, what their symptoms were, what was the plan of attack? and ultimately how they were able to function and operate in society, with their family, with their spouse, children, et cetera. So I, I, I'll give you two examples um, at two sort of extremes of the uh, spectrum. Um, early on in Iraqi freedom, a senior uh, commander was sent to me who had been in, um, at the time he was in Kuwait. He was not exposed to any um, directly excuse me he was not exposed to any um, gunfire any um any kind of uh, direct physical threat but he was an area security officer he was responsible for an area inside of um inside of iraq and responsible for the welfare of the soldiers in that area in terms of planning for their safety unfortunately one of the um one of the combat teams it was a um, a support company of 12 soldiers was kidnapped and taken prisoner by the um, Iraqis. And because this individual that I was treating, who happened to have been a uh, lieutenant colonel, was a professional, he cared so much about his people that he suffered an emotional breakdown, A, out of uh, what we call survivor guilt, but at, he had trauma resulting from the fear and realization of what might happen to his soldiers. The key to treating him was to get him to accept the fact that his concerns were real, but that he needed treatment. And his treatment consisted of therapy. It consisted of medication, which went contrary to what many soldiers would like to think. There's nothing wrong with me. I will get over it. But he was dysfunctional and required treatment from what was clearly, at that point, an acute stress reaction. We were able, a stress disorder, we were able to get him back to functioning in about six to eight weeks, and he was able to be restored to his uh, prior position. And it was mandated, of course, by his command. On the other hand, I frequently encountered and recently encountered someone who had been um, in Afghanistan, and they were in a um, armored personnel carrier, an armored vehicle, and an IED, an improvised explosive device, went off about 50 yards from their um, from their uh, vehicle. And I saw someone, I saw one of the soldiers who was in there, who now, many years later, was still having nightmares, still having flashbacks, getting into issues with domestic violence with his family, trying to self-medicate with substances. And it came to our attention only because he got into a, a, a tussle with a, a local police here in New Jersey. And the police were, I'd say, informed enough to know this wasn't a bad guy. This was a guy who was responding to some kind of a, some kind of an adverse event in the past. He was brought to treatment. He was examined. He did have an underlying, not an underlying, he had a co-occurring problem with alcohol. We addressed that. And then we went in and started to treat the um, elements of the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and he's making progress. It is not rapid. It's, he's been suffering from this for uh, about 12, 13 years, but he's making progress. His day-to-day -day function is improving. He doesn't, uh, he's not as irritable and he's able to get along with his family, go home and be with his family. And some of the consequences which exist in Israel also, for example, are a restraining order, uh, restraining order was removed from him. 
So he's able actually to be with his family and um, they're able to feel safe. So the earlier we can get to something often, uh, those are two different types of situation, two, two types of situations, but they are, uh, they're real. The earlier you get to it, the sooner you can uh, start treatment. And the other thing, by the way, also is never to rush to judgment as to what's going on. And in the case of this soldier, not to ignore the fact that there was a co-occurring problem with a substance, which can in fact happen. There was a case of, uh, I had a conversation once at this point, she was a divorcee of, uh, he was, her husband had been in Iraq, you know, it's a case of, you know, an outstanding young man who ultimately it led to substance abuse, ultimately it led to, it, it led to spousal abuse and, and they couldn't continue, you know, she just couldn't feel safe. But what was interesting is she shared with me the first symptoms he had was almost like a rush, this need for action. You know, after he came back from Iraq, you know, had to go into professions where there's like, there's a craving for the excitement, the drama of, of putting himself in a dangerous situation, a situation with a lot of action. Again, I'm just describing what, what she observed. Have you seen cases like this, soldiers coming back from the front? It's, it's not uncommon because what happens is you know, it's a question of inertia. You're used to being, you used to function at a certain level. And when that level changes, it's when people become uncomfortable. Often, uh, people who have been in these um, high stress, um, high energy, high demand, and uh, situations that activate that part of the brain, like, as we mentioned, the amygdala, and have associated physical components to it, they get used to that. And because of the neurotransmitters involved, that's what makes them feel good. But when you move from a military environment into a non-military environment, I just want to comment on that for a moment, go back for a second. But when you're when you get used to that, but you move into a civilian environment, it no longer becomes adaptive. It is no longer helpful. Unless you're well aware of it, when if you have a lot of self awareness and you know that you can control it and channel it, say into your job or into some aspect of your job, uh, it's it's troubling because um, even in the military, if this this can become problematic, having that high energy person who always you know wants to go out on a mission, who wants to feel keyed up, that isn't always necessarily a good thing. Uh, if we think about some of the jobs in the military, one of the jobs that requires not someone being all keyed up, not someone who is um, always uh, working on edge, for example, is the sniper. And the sniper, contrary to what we believe, has to be one of the most controlled individuals, one of the most thoughtful individuals, and one of, one of the most self-aware individuals. So when things become, uh, when, when you're, feeling a certain way becomes too much a part of who you are and any deviation from that results in dysfunction either in terms of domestic violence or in the case of a soldier a soldier who just can't uh how should i say not settle down but can't back down and take on the role of a day-to-day -day soldier or exhibit a lot of discipline it becomes problematic but it's not uncommon I don't I, I, I don't, I don't recall where I read this, but the numbers that, that I was, were shared with me is that for seven and a half years, post Iraq, post Afghanistan, the, our American GIs averaged 63 attempted suicides per week, 22 successful suicides per week. This is for a seven and a half year period. And per capita, you don't have anywhere near the number of suicides in the IDF that you do here. When I shared that and I asked some of the people in the Ministry of Defense who were not mental health professionals, one of the things they said they had learned from Lebanon and from other battles was they embed social workers and psychologists in the combat battalions from day one. So if I'm an 18-year-old young man or young woman going into a combat battalion, right off the bat, part of the battalion 
are social workers who are observing me, observing my behavior, my function, looking for red flags. And what the, the people from the Ministry of Defense said is that part of what has given them the ability to limit the number of suicides, and the suicides are way down. They're 20% today. I, I'm not talking about in this war. I'm talking about before this war. They're 20% of what they used to be, which is incredible that they've shrunken them to, literally to 20% of where they were. They were averaging around 40 suicides per year. They're averaging around eight suicides per year. Um, they said that was one factor. The other factor is that in Israel, they do have access to the records, the psychological records of the students in high school. And there are just certain people you don't put into a certain kind of stressful situation. You're not going to put them in a, in a unit which, which can really put, create an incredible amount of stress. So again, I, I'm more throwing that out at you to hear your assessment, your analysis, because obviously for, for decades you've had to work with American GIs that have had suicidal thoughts and unfortunately had to deal with suicide. So it goes back, first of all, to, um, to what I was talking about before. And you, and you, it was great that, that you brought it up, is that in Israel, um, and I'm not going to get into the uh, philosophy of HIPAA and non-HIPAA, but they are aware of the people's, of each soldier's prior psychological record. And if there is someone who is at risk, and as I mentioned, they put a lot of people forward into Iraq and Afghanistan who did not have the resilience to go forward. Here, you may have screened out. In Israel, they may be succeeding in screening out the people who are at the highest risk for exposure to any type of a, a traumatic event. And I think that's um, it's a brilliant way to handle it. You know, the, the whole set of ethics around it in terms of privacy and all, that's a whole other discussion. But from a purely medical point of view, it makes sense. You screen. And just as you screen people for professions within the military, you know, who's going to be a pilot, who's going to be a, a commander, who's going to have access to, um, you know, to make lethal fire decisions, that all has to be screened. And I think in Israel, they're probably doing a much better job of it. And I'll mention one other thing. When you talk about Israel, you're talking about a, a country the size of New Jersey. People are... Um, people can feel more a part of what they're doing when you come to the united states it's a huge organization and people may feel kind of like once they get into the military they're on their own to one degree or another in israel it's almost like you know the next if not you there's only several degrees of separation between you and someone who is either like you or related to you or knows someone that you know so it's um i think it's a more a more comfortable environment and a more suitable one for starting starting to feel comfortable, and then also, as you said, to to sort people out who maybe shouldn't be um, shouldn't be going forward. And having mental health people embedded is critical. I mean, I, I it's a very this is a it, it just spent as an analogy, but it's like in the Soviet Union they used to have political officers in the units to pick up on the slightest degree of aberrant behavior on someone's part. That was about politics. But if you imagine switching that out for a social worker who is keyed in to what could it be early signs and symptoms of PTSD, it can serve that function. Dr. Berman, we are very grateful, incredibly grateful. And the, we may, if, you know, as, as this foray into dealing with the PTSD, and I just want to share with our listeners the numbers we're getting of those who are physically wounded, 24% of them have PTSD. The numbers we're getting, and please, Dr. Berman, if you can confirm if I'm saying something wrong, that in general, 10% of anyone on a front line will have acute PTSD, that those are numbers from Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon. Here is a function of a number of factors. Some of it is friendly fire deaths. Some of it is a function of what they experienced on October 7th in Kibbutz Beiri, in Kfaraza, in Ativa Sara, these places near Oz, Nachal Oz. Um, I just, we, we spoke to generals who were, who've been in the army for 35 years. They've never in their whole career, having fought three wars, never seen the kind of brutality, the kind of scenes that they experienced October 7th and October 8th. 
on the home front and those communities on the Gaza envelope. They're, that's a factor. And the other factor is the brutality of this war. So whereas 10% seems to be the number, the historic number, it, we're looking at closer to 15% of anyone on the front line from this war. And again, that, that's a function of those three variables. The br brutality of this very, very dense urban warfare where you've got people using human shields, you've got people dressed as civilians coming at you from popping out of tunnels, etc. Um, this is going to be really one of the great challenges of the generation. Those are not my terms. The Ministry of Defense has put this as one of their primary goals, that these young men and young women who've sacrificed themselves, that they should be sent back into the world, into their families, into the job place in a healthy way, in a psychological healthy way. And that's why they've asked us to contribute to almost $90 million for all the different dimensions that, that Dr. Berman spoke about, whether it was the early detection, whether it's the treatment while they're in the army, those who have it so acute, they have to be discharged from the army or they get it as veterans coming back, you know, years after the battle, having a whole network of facilities throughout the length and breadth of Israel. And then the point that Dr. Berman was making of resilience the training, the resilience training for every combat soldier that, that has never taken place before in any army that is taking place now. Um, Dr. Berman, th it's very likely we're going to be asking you to come back because this, so to speak, is we're only maybe in the first inning of a nine inning saga when it comes to the PTSD. And, and it may morph, it may evolve in, in different directions. And, and I, on behalf of all of us, we can't thank you enough, not only what you've done for our staff, what, you're, what you've done today, what you've done for our American GIs who really sacrificed their youth and their innocence in Iraq, Afghanistan. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you to continue learning from you. Thank you, Robert. It's my pleasure okay. and my obligation. Thank you. Just one thing that we did not note at the beginning that should be noted. Dr. Berman's son, Yona, who today is Rabbi Yona Berman, was a lone soldier, went from New Jersey, was a, a combat soldier in the IDF, and today is one of the leaders of American Jewry, really an, an outstanding and outstanding individual, who part of his development was that experience of being a lone soldier in the IDF. And we thank, we thank you, we thank your son, Yona, for that contribution. Thank you. Uh, Lara Krinsky will be moderating on Sunday. And we look forward to seeing everyone once again this coming Sunday for our next briefing. Thank you.